at the end of the day, we kind of just need to experiment. Like we don't really know who we are. And I feel like what a lot of people think when they first start up is you need to have the idea right away. Yeah. For us, we, I mean, we knew we wanted to get out of our comfort zones, but we weren't totally sure what that looked like. It looked like project 30 at first, but after project 30, we're like, what the hell right. do we do from here? And will we run out of ideas, you know? Mm-hmm. Let's all start with a deep breath. Ready? Three, two, one. <sighs> all right. All right. A few years back, I was scrolling on YouTube.com and stumbled on a video titled, Get a Like from the Guy Who Launched the Like Button. The video was by a YouTube group known as Yes Theory. I then watched another. We got our holiday card with the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. The style of the videos were unique to say the least, like nothing I've ever seen on YouTube before. But perhaps more interesting than the style of the videos was the message behind them. That message is so catchy, so compelling, that it turned into their channel's slogan, purpose, and apparel line, Seek Discomfort. I was hooked. This is why I'm thrilled to have an interview with Matt Dowhair, the co-founder of the viral YouTube sensation Yes Theory, and Zach Hanover, Yes Theory's manager. They have over 4 million YouTube subscribers and were the first YouTubers to have their own Snapchat discovery show. Through their online content, they have heli bungee jumped with Will Smith, willingly frozen themselves alive in the middle of Poland, and yes, the keyword is willingly there. That is, by the way, documented in a long-form YouTube documentary on their channel called Frozen Alive. And how could I forget? Prank Justin Bieber's mom along with the rest of the internet with the viral fake Justin Bieber sideways burrito photo. In this interview, we will discuss everything from the crazy story that is Yes Theory's inception to where the Yes Theory brand is heading in the future. And of course, why Yes Theory believes that life is best lived outside of your comfort zone. I hope you're as excited as I am. This is The Ones Who Succeed. I'm Campbell Barron. Episode 13 starts now. Thank you, Matt and Zach, for coming on the program. Wow. Dude, thanks for having us. (laughs) (laughs) Campbell, you're probably one of, uh, I'd say one of five people who I've met for the first time who pronounced my last name correctly. You know how I did it? How? Shout out to Colin and Samir. I listened to their interview with your brother and uh, and <laughs> like practiced how you pronounced it. Wow. Yeah. wow, that just came out two days ago too. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. That. And uh, congratulations on 4 million subscribers. Thank that's you. a huge deal. Like if you think about 4 million, that's more than most major cities in North America. Like it's cra- <laughs> that's crazy. Thank you, man. Um, so I want to kind of talk a lo- about a lot of things here, right? So you guys kind of joined forces together. Um, but I want to start um, quickly with Yes Theory's inception. Um, I heard the, I've heard the story. It's super interesting. How did that start? It started in Montreal. Shout out to Canada. We got a whole Canadian crowd here. This is yes, amazing. Uh, it started when I finished school. I was a year out of school and I met Thomas. Uh, I was running a clothing company at the time and Thomas had a small YouTube channel. Yeah. And my clothing company was still quite small and I wanted to promote it. And Thomas was in a marketing class and they were doing a project on companies in Montreal and they picked my company to help uh, market for Um, So I met Thomas through his class and uh, as we got to talking, I realized like I started to watch a few of his videos that he had made. He had done a few skits on a small YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I realized there's potential for us to collaborate and make videos together potentially to promote my clothing brand. Yeah. So in uh, May, around May 2015 in Montreal, Thomas and I uh, started making videos together of just doing silly things, wearing the clothing, my company's clothing yeah uh like dancing with strangers was one Mm -hmm. and we had such a good time doing it that we decided that we'd spend uh we'd try and spend a whole summer uh doing things that got us out of our comfort zone and so as we were starting to prepare for that we weren't too sure what it would look like but we met amar very uh, very very randomly uh in montreal as well and the three of us together kind of launched this thing that we called Project 30, and Project 30 was uh, the idea of doing 30 things in 30 days that we'd never done before. Right. Uh, And at the time, the three of us were all in agreement that we felt pretty unfulfilled and that we wanted to do something that really pushed us and got us out of our comfort zones. Um, And we had no idea at the time that what we were starting would be kind of like a revolution in our minds uh, and like an evolution of how to approach life. Um, Mm -hmm. And... uh, Yeah, as the 30 days went on, we started to do things from like getting an ear piercing, which felt crazy was one of the days, to uh, doing synchro dance. Uh, We had never ice skated before. Uh So like putting on dresses and learning how to synchro dance was one of them. Uh, We tried to get the mayor of Montreal. You you got the mayor. We got the mayor of Montreal. Thank you. Yeah, well, you you watch the videos. Um, And so by the end of it, after the 30 days of doing a, a, a thing every day that we'd never done before we we had never felt more fulfilled in our entire lives yeah we felt uh very very free 
uh, and we felt like anything was possible. And we wanted to spread that message not only in our own lives and to our friends, but to a bigger and wider audience. So we dropped everything we do, we're doing. I dropped my clothing company. Thomas dropped um, like whatever jobs he was applying for. And Amar had a, had a startup at the time that yeah. he was working on. And he dropped that too. And we committed full time to YouTube uh, and to spreading the message of seeking discomfort. And that was uh, almost exactly four years ago now. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about dropping everything because mm-hmm. that's not as easy as it sounds. No. So if you were working on your clothing, uh, mm-hmm. lot, your clothing company, right? Um, I know Thomas had previous experience in Silicon Valley with startups mm-hmm. um, and, and Amar working on a startup. Right. What was it that, that convinced you, all three of you, that this was the path for you? Mm-hmm. Each other, the trust in each other. Uh, I think all of us were solo entrepreneurs when we met mm-hmm. and we had all dreamed of having a team that believed in each other and believed in the craziest dreams possible. Uh, and we had never met, uh, I had never met anybody like Thomas or Amar who were willing to do the same thing as me and drop everything uh, and sacrifice like family, personal relationships, job offers, everything to make a dream work. And I think that's, that kind of like risk taking ability is such a unique trait that when you find it, you just like latch on and yeah. hold tight and go. You know? That's 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 super interesting. And then Zach, you had an entrepreneurial background when you were a kid. You you were a hustler. Talk yeah. a little about that. Um, I think my earliest remembrance of being entrepreneurial was like either selling basketball cards. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember even like telling kids that didn't know a lot about basketball players that like oh this player is like he's really up and coming like you should buy this card and it was like a nobody um and so i would like sell basketball cards and like make up stories about the players to make the cards more appealing and then in grade seven i started to go with my mom to costco and buy snickers and mars bars and and o henry's and all this and that and and sell them to kids so i would get my mom to buy them in bulk and then i started to realize like oh i can eat one or two and then get kids to pay me for them individually and then I can do stuff with that the rest of that money and then as I started growing it was just kind of like serial entrepreneur I always liked the idea of like turning one into two and turning two into four and turning Mm -hmm. four into eight and I didn't grow up with a lot of money and I grew up basketball was like the main thing so I really wanted basketball shoes I wanted Jordans I wanted like I loved Iverson so I like wanted armbands and jerseys and I couldn't afford to get them from my parents so I was like okay well what can I do to get the money to buy these things Mm -hmm. so that's really where the entrepreneurship started and then um, when I went to university I ended up turning that into a tutoring company Um, I at one point started a a men's uh, focused blog around like fashion sports um, business and music I called it the well-balanced man Um, So I always had a side hustle. Yeah. That was kind of what drove me into entrepreneurship. I think, uh, at least from what I've read, one of the best things that I've heard that describes you is the crowdsource laptop. Can you talk a little (laughs) about that? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So when I was in my final year of university, I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I originally thought that entrepreneurship would manifest itself within some form of tech. Mm -hmm. I was in Waterloo, Ontario, which is like tech capital of Canada. And uh, I figured that like if I stayed around that city, I would get, you know, start something within a tech background. And I had a lot of engineer friends um, that would tell me, hey, when business students talk to us, um, if they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to technology, they sound like idiots. And that was like, oh, shit. OK, I don't want to be one of those idiots. Yeah. I'll go take an introductory computer science class. Mm-hmm. So there was an online uh, introductory computer science class offered through Harvard on a platform called edX. And you could take it for free. And at the end of the course, if you pass, you can pay $100 and get their certificate saying that you passed. So I started taking the class, but I had a really shitty Sony laptop that crashed within the two first weeks of my class. Um, and I didn't have a laptop. So I would go to like the school computers to finish like do the courses and it was so tough and I came up with this idea uh of like well my laptop is kind of like a billboard for people and brands because there's so many kids that see it through a lecture hall or through me working in the school concourse and I thought to myself okay well I'll book all these meetings with different companies in the local area and I'll go to them and sell them square inches on the face of my laptop and basically say put your logo on it and I found a laser etching company that could laser etch it so it wasn't a cheap sticker so it looked super premium 
And I kind of played this chicken and the egg scenario where I went to newspapers and I said, hey, if I can pull this off, will you write about it in the local newspaper? And they all said, yeah, if you pull this off, we'll write about you. So then I took that and I went to businesses and I said, I have commitments from these newspapers to write about me if I pull this off. Don't you want to be the brand that is like the one supporting the kid who's maxed out on student loans and all that? So then I sold, I think it was like $40 yeah. per square inch. Um and then I raised about sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars. So I got a MacBook Air with three years Apple Care. Uh, and then the laser yeah. etching company. I told the laser etching company, if you can etch it for free, I'll put your lap or I'll put your logo on it too. Incredible. Yeah, so you so. were you were selling you were essentially selling brand deals. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's a precursor to yes uh, to yes theory on your laptop. Yeah, and I was showing up to these places with like a a, a laminated brochure that I was giving out, and I was like showing up in a suit. And I always like like to wear suits before. Now I'm like the opposite. But uh-huh. I used to I'd show up to like a property management company that's selling uh, apartments to students f- to live in. And I'd sit down with a suit. I'd give them this nice laminated paper. And I'd be like, there's nothing that differentiates you from the next property management company. But this could make you guys look like someone who supports the student that's barely getting by. Yeah. And if you're in these newspapers, yada, yada, it's nothing for you to give me $600 right now. But it can be the biggest marketing move of your year. Same and they thing. were all like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Those companies said no. That's, that's It was actually interesting. The first three meetings I think I took, they were like, this is interesting. Let me ask my boss. And they all said no. And I, I remember there was a moment that I was doing it. It was really funny because I always do these chicken and egg scenarios where I say I have something that I don't. Like I was working at a, a company called Sun Life Financial, which is a big finance insurance company yeah. in, in uh, Toronto and Canada. And I was while I was working there, I wasn't doing the work that I was supposed to be doing at that company. I was doing this. And I actually put Sun Life's logo on this thing and said, Laurier and Sun Life have already given me $500 each. So I'm actually only raising the second half. They had never done it. And even Incredible. when the laptop came out, I went to those brands and said, actually, I ended up making so much money that I actually told Sun Life and uh, Laurier, don't worry about it. You don't need to give me the money. So I would go into all those meetings pretending like I was already half of the way there. First three companies said no. Once I got the first one that said yes, it gave me a rush of confidence and it snowballed from there. Yeah. And then once I got like to 1200, a few friends were like, yo, we'll put in 50 bucks. And I even put in like all my roommates put in 50 bucks and we got like the Ezra boys, which was like the street we lived on in university on the laptop as well. So then I started to get like friends that were like, holy shit, you're almost yeah. there, dude. Like I'll give you 50 bucks. Um, so that was really cool too. And so I want to go back to you, Matt. That's that's an incredible story. And I wanted to bring that up because I think it shows hustle. It shows persistence. It shows a little bit of brand marketing set. Like, it's, it's really cool. Um, so going back to Project 30, you guys came out of that. The channel grew, but it was not – you didn't have a million subscribers. You were still uh, kind of – trying to trying to get more subscribers grow your footprint um and in, and i want to bring this up because in this in the startup lingo you've probably heard this term but they call this this phase where there isn't a hundred uh, like a real product market fit they call this the trough of sorrow mm. where they the gears haven't actually connected yet mm. can you talk a little bit about that and kind of what kept you going forward um yeah so that was right after the summer that was september to around uh, mid-november for about two and a half months where we had finished Project 30 and we weren't totally sure what we were doing. Um, we'd never been like a full YouTube channel, you know? Mm-hmm. Like this was the first time we had, weren't doing a thing every single day and we had to right. like actually think about ideas. Um, and the more and more we, we started to to like kind of sit on ideas, we were just like, at the end of the day, we kind of just need to experiment. Like we don't really know who we are. And I feel like what a lot of people think when they first start up is you need to have the idea right away yeah for us we i mean we knew we wanted to get out of our comfort zones but we weren't totally sure what that looked like it looked like project 30 at first but after project 30 we're like what the hell right do we do from here and will we run out of ideas you know mm-hmm. um but we so we started to just try out a bunch of different stuff like um, i remember mar dressed up in like a santa suit and he was egyptian santa like there were so many strange ideas that we threw out there uh, we tried like kind of vlog style where we like went to the airport to pick up Amar for one of them when he came back from school. Yeah. Um, it was just like, it was so random. But then uh, we we kind of realized, even at, although like our audience was quite small, the power of community um, at that time even, we had about 2,000 subscribers. But we we realized that if we could leverage the, even that small platform and like do something cool, it could spread to a wider audience. And so... Um, 
the the Paris attacks that happened in November was yeah. was a huge moment, um, obviously for us for the whole world. But mm-hmm. um, we it was something that felt very authentic to us, and we wanted to to kind of use this small platform that we had to put out a message that we didn't know how many people would hear. Uh, and so after the Paris attacks happened, Amar Thomas Darren and I, who was the fourth member at the time, yeah. um, we went to the busiest metro station in montreal uh with signs that said uh i'm matt i'm from new york and then thomas had i'm thomas i'm from paris and then amar had uh a t-shirt that said i'm amar i'm a muslim from egypt yeah and uh we had a sign in front of us that said love over fear and they cannot separate us and to us it was just kind of putting out a message that meant a lot to us and we at 9 a.m went to the metro station bowed our heads to get down and held our hands together um, and waited for the train in front of us to open. And as it opened, um, we kept our eyes closed, but we could hear like shuffling around us and we didn't, we weren't like totally sure what was happening. Uh, and then after five minutes, we all like agree that we would open our eyes and lift our heads. And we looked around and it was just a sea of people. Like all these people that were rushing to work just stopped. Yeah. Uh, and people were crying. People were taking photos People were like holding on to each other. People were now coming up to us to hug us. And we're like, oh my God, what the hell? What is happening? Yeah. Boys, what's going well, on? <laughs> if, if you see the video, it's incredible. Thank like, you. Yeah. What actually happens, it, it's touching. Mm-hmm. And that that video, that was definitely a turning point. You guys were on CTV News, which uh, yeah. is like a, a news station in, in Montreal. Yeah. Um, and that was so, like, was that, a, was that a big turning point that definitely probably spiked your. I think it was a turning point, not just in terms of uh, the awareness that the. the that like our channel got you know mm-hmm. um and like that we were happy that the message spread but more importantly for for our friendship it really felt like putting it on the line because we'd known each other for four barely four months and we were saying already like this is my best friend yeah you know and i i've known him obviously and we've done all this incredible stuff together and like i feel closer to him than people i've known for 16 years um and it was like exposing that to the world and like risking that in front of you know the public mm-hmm. um and then when we got that reaction from people and when it, it turned out the way it did um we felt so strong and it felt so unbreakable uh and then from that point on we realized the more authentic we stick like we are and the more we speak how we feel and we do what we want uh the more it'll resonate with people and the more we will feel fulfilled so um gradually we started making videos that meant more to us and that that uh really helped expose what we were doing Uh uh-huh and then you guys made more and more videos uh Mm -hmm. i want to talk a little bit about um the email yes Uh, so famous email. yeah the the famous email but Mm -hmm. it was was a huge turning point yeah for i mean for sure we in november so about two weeks after that video came out uh after the paris attacks um we got an email darren actually one of our members saw it um and it was it said something like um we love the content you guys are making we'd love to fly you out to Venice Beach and to have a show on Snapchat with us. And it was from a company called Vertical Networks. And we were getting, we were starting to get a good amount of emails at the time from uh, like MCNs and and networks and production companies. So we kind of thought it was just another one of those because we'd been on calls with people and it felt like they were ripping us off. They'd send us contracts where they'd take like 40 to 50% of our three years future revenue. And we were like, "Uh, no thanks. (laughs) So we thought it was one of those um so we we ignored it and then uh three days later we were just having lunch and darren was again like yeah guys i think that that we should probably look into this email like it looks different you know i looked up vertical networks and it seems kind of legit um and so we're like okay let's answer and we're like yeah this sounds interesting like let's hop on a call uh and so we hopped on a call with the team vertical networks in los angeles which is a production company that does vertical content for snapchat yeah Uh, and they explained that they were looking for a group of friends to come out to LA and pretty much do what we were doing and go on adventures and make a show three days a week on Snapchat. It would be paid. We would have a home. Um, everything would be taken care of. Keep in mind, at the time we were broke, so this yeah. was like hearing, like, <laughs> God, yeah, just be like, here you go. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and after uh, shooting a pilot for them, which was actually... Uh, we filmed the thing with Justin Trudeau where yeah. we dressed up in uh, holiday Christmas sweaters. and Oh, interesting. That was the pilot. That was the pilot. So we pilot. filmed that in ver- in horizontal but in vertical for Snapchat. Yeah. So we sent them a cut that of what it would look like for Snap. Um, and they loved it. Uh, and they funded our first project 
uh, to go film in the Caribbean for four months and essentially do what we had done that summer. So Project 30 in the Caribbean. So that was our first stint on Snapchat. And after those four months, we moved to L.A. and did it full time. Mm -hmm. And so at what point in the story do you come along? He Matt briefly mentioned, you know, essentially getting offers that were basically taking advantage of uh, their size and, and where they were in, in the Yes Theory journey. Um, and you have a very interesting ethos uh, in regards to how the relationship between you and your cl- uh, and your talent, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. I think there was a quote on your website that, something, that said something like, uh, influencers should be treated as startups as opposed to just talent. And I thought that was really cool. And they need CEOs like, like a startup does. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it was essentially from what I saw in, in my position as in someone who represents talent that's more of a digital creator yeah. or someone who's making videos is something that like hasn't existed you know, before, let's say 10 years ago was probably the first time it ever existed. Digital creators themselves are, have not, haven't existed 10 years ago. So managing musical artists have, has existed for a long, long time, but I feel like I'm one of the first few. And I'm looking at these people that are managing influencers, and I see a lot of it is very transactional. It's a lot of like, let me just negotiate this thing for a brand, and then you just get your money, I take my cut, and we just are both happy. Yeah. And I think that one of the initial things I saw with these guys are like, there's such a business here like this is the whole thing is like not just a business in itself there's an ecosystem there's a community there's like this thing can be so scalable because it's not about matt thomas amar it's about this idea and this philosophy Mm -hmm. and um i started to see that like oh yeah I, i don't like how talent or especially creators are being treated like influencers i hate that word um and i think it's like a you're throwing all of them into one bucket i think there's influencers out there but i don't think that these guys are influencers they have influence um and so um i started to realize that like the the term ceo is so much better because these guys aren't influencers they're a startup um and they should be treated like a business so that's kind of where that thought process came from and i wanted to be one of the first few that starts to become a manager that like some of the music managers i looked up to weren't about transactions but they were about building someone into an infrastructure and caring about their mental health and caring about them as humans so that they could be successful into their 30s, 40s, and 50s and not just take advantage while they're hot and then move on to the next. Yeah, so I think that's super interesting. You mentioned the word startup. And this is kind of one of my biggest questions. I've always wanted to ask this. I even think I asked Zach this early on in a call. You guys all essentially, and by you, Matt, Amar, Thomas, kind of Mm -hmm. came from startup backgrounds, essentially. You had a a clothing company that could be considered a startup, Mm -hmm. right? Matt Thomas was working at a, a working for like created a tech company before Mm -hmm. Um, Amar was raising money for a tech company. Um, And and then you kind of transition into this Project 30 thing, this media endeavor. Um, do you think of this as a startup? Do you think of what you're building with Yes Theory? Is this like a startup? I'm a- 100%, yeah. And from the beginning, we never just wanted to be a YouTube channel. Uh, we saw, like Zach said, the potential of how big and wide it could go. Um, but when it was the three of us, in LA focusing on making content, it was hard to kind of expand out of making content. Like we realized, I mean, essentially, what was it? Three years in, um, like two and a half years in that we needed like somebody, essentially a CEO to kind of lead the, the, the charge for that. Um, so that we could continue focusing on ideas and, and like expanding the content and have somebody really deal with the business side. Cause as much as we are, uh, like entrepreneurs and yeah. call ourselves entrepreneurs. Um, we're not as much like the business negotiating, um, like... Well, it's labor intensive too. Right. It, it wouldn't make sense for you guys to be doing that if you were focusing, if you were creating content. And exactly. You, and you yeah. figured that out already. Exactly. And I think there's, like, we, we really hone in on the creative side and Zach is just, a, a, like, from the very beginning, really showed us what was possible um, on the business and the financial side and uh, and, like... As much as you want to be this pretty, like startup and YouTube, with this big message, like you do need the finances to fund a lot of these ideas and uh, spread the message globally. And Zach came in and established exactly how we would do that, and within a year, completely shifted the entire business. So, mm-hmm. all right. When we get back, we'll talk about Yes Theory uh, and expanding into the future, where there will be heading, as well as the message of seek discomfort. 
Wim Hof, their documentary endeavors, and much, much more. This is The Ones Who Succeed. I'm Campbell Barron. We'll be right back. Coming up, I continue my conversation, but first, a quick message from our sponsor. This season of The Ones Who Succeed is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes in business, marketing, technology, design, and more. You can take classes in social media marketing, video editing, entrepreneurship, you name it, they've got it. So whether you're trying to deepen your professional skill set, start a side hustle, or just explore a new passion, Skillshare is there to keep you learning and thriving. So join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today because Skillshare is offering the first 250 people who click the link in the description two months of unlimited access to over 20,000 classes all for free. To sign up, go to skillshare.com succeed. Again, that's skillshare.com succeed to start your first two months now. And a special thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this season. This is The Ones Who Succeed. I'm Campbell Barron. I'm joined by Matt and Zach, members of Yes Theory. Thank you for coming on the program again. Thank so you. where we last, let's like pick up where we last uh, mm-hmm. left off here. Um, we talked a little bit about expansion, right? So I think many of the people who are, are going to be watching this, who know who you are, kind of see you as YouTubers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always been interested in, sure, you could be YouTube creators, but I think there's much, much more to the brand than just being influencers or YouTubers. Mm-hmm. I think it can expand to many things. And you guys are are definitely in that process. Um, there's been talks of a book coming eventually, and there's been talks of a podcast. And then there's also been like sneak peek stories at um, some maybe Netflix offices. So there's definitely something interesting brewing <laughs> there. But I want to talk a little bit about expansion and where you see this brand going, Matt. The way uh, Amar loves to put it, which Zach kind of harps him on a little bit, is the we want this to be uh, a thousand year long project. So to live far beyond us, beyond myself, Amar, Thomas, beyond Zach. Um, and what that looks like is uh, is the community. It's the audience. So what can we do, not for ourselves, but for people who watch us? Uh, how do we give them the tools to to grow as individuals and then spread the message within their own communities as well. Um, And so, like you said, that entails making content like podcasts and, uh, and making more videos, et cetera. But I think it also entails like, um, like how do you, like, for example, an app where people can meet and go on adventures together, you know, or like a, a course where people learn how to seek discomfort or a festival where they can all like thousands and thousands of them can come and experience it. On such, like on a much much bigger scale, um, and I think a lot of these things will live on beyond our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is the the impetus; it's the the, the thing that kind of ignites these things. But then they go on and have their own uh, lives. Yeah. And for example, I guess seek discomfort would be the first kind of iteration of that. Where initially seek discomfort. I mean, even for the next year or two, will likely be pushed by Yes Theory. But the goal is like we just recently hired an amazing creative director. Um, to kind of take it and expand it beyond our audience and see like how far this message can go beyond the people that watch us because seek discomfort is not, I mean, it is a yes theory thing, but it's also a universal yeah. uh, the commitment to living a fulfilling life, which everybody wants to do. Um, and if you give them those simple lines of how to do it, something that just like snaps in their head, like if you're, if you're feeling it uncomfortable, if you're feeling terrible, if like, you're in a position where you're about to start a podcast, like, you know, or start a business or like quit school to travel because that's what you really want to do. Or like ask out a girl that you love, like all this stuff with those two lines on your shirt or wherever is the can possibly change your entire life. Um, and that doesn't require yes theory. Uh, mm-hmm. And so uh, when we're 35 or 40 years old, who knows if we'll be still making YouTube videos, but I think one thing's for sure is we'll have these other legs to the Yes Theory arsenal, and uh, those legs will spread far and wide. And honestly, again, credits to Zach is like he's made us see those legs and the potential in them. Because forever we kind of like wanted to start these things, but he really put it into action um, and like hired the right people around it to make it happen for real. And now it's happening way faster than any of us could have ever predicted, which is 
pretty incredible. So I want to make this comparison, and and mm-hmm. there it's definitely uh, this comparison is there. There are definitely some differences, but how I see it, if you think of how Vice started out, mm-hmm. they started out with a, a show. Right. It was a uh, Vice mm-hmm. on HBO. I think, yeah, it, the Vice is it was super interesting. But they started with that show, and then they branched out, created more and more shows. Mm-hmm. If you see, if you, and this is maybe to Zach, because it sounds like you ha- you definitely have this vision too. If you see Yes Theory as as a media company, right, um, and and you want to scale beyond Thomas, Amar, and Matt, right, it wants you want to you want to be the face of it, but also not be the face of it, right, and make that work. How does how does that happen? Um, you know, you could branch out into a podcast. A lot of YouTubers are doing that. You could branch out into a book, um, but if it's still tied into Yes Theory and if it's still tied into that that one brand, it doesn't seem as scalable. So how do you, how does this scale? Yeah. Uh, and that's a great question. And uh, as much as I uh, have some sort of vision, I don't have the concrete answer and we're all trying to figure it out together. Um, I think Matt's giving me a little bit more credit than is due, but uh, I think what, uh, what I'm thinking is that the differentiator between these guys and a lot of different YouTube channels is that, um, and this is interesting. I even thought about it from the logo that they have, like the, I guess you can call it like the, uh, a- avatar or whatever yeah. like the circle logo yeah is a yes theory logo yeah or like it's a logo yeah everyone else's is a face mm-hmm. um and i think a lot of people watch different youtube channels because the personality on there is really funny or really good looking or really whatever like can teach them a lot these guys are being watched because people watch it and such as yourself and go yeah. holy crap i want to live my life like that yeah. mm-hmm. and that philosophy and ideology is scalable and the thing is and we've done this before with a few video projects but th- people will still enjoy content whether or not these guys appear in the video or not, as long as it lives under the same philosophy and ideology. Um, and hopefully as we grow and scale and get larger, they can continuously put other people in the spotlight. And uh, if those people are doing things that live under the same mantra, if they're uh, living under the same ideology or showing things and educating the audience about those things, then it doesn't need to be them. Um, and we, I don't know when that'll happen, and I don't know uh, whether that's also the right thing. And it comes at this like dilemma of if you do that too soon, then the thing isn't big enough and people don't catch on. Right. But if you go too far, then it becomes totally about these guys. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm saying that I don't know because I don't know what that right time place is, but it's all about experimenting. And for example, a year ago, or maybe at this point, almost two years ago, these guys did a series called The Yes Profiles where they highlighted other entrepreneurs and creatives. And it was almost like a profiling video yeah. where uh, they highlighted their biggest yes moment. Um, and that was our, their first attempt at making videos that weren't even them in the video, but were about other people. And the audience still watched it and went, holy shit, that's still inspiring. That's still teaching me how to live under this philosophy and ideology. So hopefully more experiments like that. And if the audience reacts positively and says, like, as much as we love Matt, Thomas and Amar, it's also cool to see others then potentially we can do more and more under that. And I think once we build a really large umbrella, which we're starting to do, our curation and the team being able to say like, hey guys, like under the Yes Theory podcast umbrella, we have this guy named Campbell who is freaking a star and his ideologies and values match our ideologies, yeah. uh, ideologies and values. So you should go watch his podcast and you're under the Yes Theory umbrella, then it helps you because you get access to fans that yeah. are just like you and yeah. believe in things just like you. Yeah. And we get value because we get a rock star like you under the umbrella. So potentially things like that in the future too. That is, that's super interesting, um, kind of scaling this brand um, p- past uh, the three of you. And I think, I think one Do of the have things... The papers with, for Campbell to sign right now? Yeah, on, <laughs> on camera. <Yeah. laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things with, uh, with your brand, um, especially that, and, and I, we had a call, I had a call with Zach before, uh, mm-hmm. like two months ago, I think, and your answer to this was so cool, so I, wa- I want you to repeat this. But one of the fears of many YouTuber, YouTubers, and I know we talked about why you aren't just YouTubers, but let's just kind of mm-hmm. narrow this in, is becoming irrelevant. Mm-hmm. That is a fear of many YouTubers. Um, it happens. There are people who could like fight that and kind of reinvent themselves. But staying and the word relevant, um, some could question what that really means. But let's just use that for now. How does Yes Theory as a brand, we've already talked about kind of how they're going to expand, um, how you guys could see yourself as more than just uh influencers more than just YouTubers um, and actually have a long-term impact on the world. But 
in in the short term, how does Yes Theory, the three of you, Thomas, you know, Matt, Amar, how do you guys stay relevant? And and either of you can answer that. But I think that's. Did you have an answer for it? it, well, it I don't doesn't, remember. It doesn't, it what did I say? Did you, you prompt me on what I said? <laughs> well, I, I basically what I'm just I'm trying to get at is. Um, and if you want, I could say it, but I thought it was super interesting. Essentially, people don't watch, and we've talked about this briefly, but people don't kind of subscribe and, and watch Yes Theory you know, because Matt and Thomas and Amar are like so cute. Right, they're yeah, not uh, fanboying. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not, cute, but they're, 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 that's not why they watch. No, exactly. but that's it. They're not. They're, yeah, no, it's, okay. you, you guys aren't like. I don't, I don't think you guys aren't fanboys. You get yeah, the yeah. people watch because of the message, mm -hmm. and I think that is how. If you look at a brand, Vice doesn't become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, so, so why would why would Yes Theory? That that was. Yeah. And if you guys want to add on to that, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go first really quickly. I guess, um, yeah, because it can become this. Thing. I want my goal personally or one of the many goals I have is for yes theory to become like synonymous with that like moment where in 10 years two kids will be in high school and one will go to the other and go yo this weekend we should open up a lemonade stand and see if we can make 500 bucks and that dude turn around to him and be like dude that's so yes theory let's do it and that to be like synonymous with that moment of like let's just do it like that seems uncomfortable and it seems like something that's like random but it'd be a fun project let's do it or like someone goes to their friend and goes like yo this weekend we decided that we're gonna like take a road trip and go to this mountain and turn our phones off and just like be in wilderness with one another like you want to do that and for the other person to go like dude let's seek discomfort yeah. and that to be like a household thing in the same way we say like we're gonna google stuff or we're gonna like uber somewhere um that's kind of my goal so i think those things live beyond these guys because they end up um, and a good mentor of mine kind of gave me the imagery of like right now it's like the audience and the community is at the bottom of a pyramid and Matt, Thomas and Amar at the top and everyone's looking at them like what are you guys doing? What are the experiences? Like what's cool? And eventually I think the goal is to flip the pyramid where Matt, Thomas and Amar at the, at the bottom empowering that community to be able to do things within themselves and for them to be the real scalable thing and they can have meetups where the guys aren't even there but it's considered a media meetup because it's still the community which yeah. is already starting to happen. Yeah, no, you see them on social yeah. media a lot. They're, but I'm you, curious to know what your answer would be. Like what how do you think about becoming irrelevant because i'm sure deep down there's <laughs> yeah. like some sort of everyone of has a fear yeah i'm not gonna deny it yeah 100 percent. yeah something we think about pretty regularly um i think amar thinks about it the least amar is convinced yeah. do you use that word becoming irrelevant like i think the word irrelevant like is you know that's a U very youtube -y social yeah. media thing is there like a different word that you guys would describe essentially your that um so uh, actually i i I had this actual this exact conversation with Samir two days ago. Uh, Samir is a great yes. friend of mine. Oh yeah, you listen to the podcast. Call in Samir. Um, and I was telling him that fear is like I'm afraid that uh, in a year or two's time, like people will move on, and it's like a fear I can't fully get rid of. Um, and he said something really profound. He he said pretty much like what what YouTubers generally give uh, is like like you were saying the entertainment, right? You're giving the entertainment you're watching me do this thing cool um but what he said is we're giving people people aren't we're not making people watch us we're making people watch themselves yeah so you're looking inwards when you watch our videos That's and you're like how bad. can i apply this to my life mm -hmm. um and when he, this and this is again what he said he's like when you do that to people it's a lifelong thing mm -hmm. so even if our video if we stop making videos in two years the uh, the impact um is so long lasting that that kind of eased my mind. It's like, either way, the the YouTube channel dies in two years for, for whatever reason. Um, we'll have done so much more than I could have ever dreamed of personally to impact however many lives we have that it's a success. From this point onwards, it's a, it's been a success um, and that's forever. So uh, you can't really become irrelevant or fail at this point. I think it's um, everything else now is just a bonus. Let's see how far we can take it. The main thing that we've always avoided is hopping on trends. Like we, we try and avoid trends. YouTube is made full of trends and people rise with trends and die with trends. Yeah. Same with music. Uh, and the artists that Zach and I love and that, like, I mean, that we've followed for a decade now are the ones that really spoke authentically and found their own voice and evolved and experimented as well. But, uh, never like saw the shortcuts and went for them like we 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 accept the long process and things you know 
Uh huh. Do you, do you want to add on to anything? No, I think he, he nailed it. He I, gave I, a lot I, better I, answer than I gave. Um, I don't know. I think it's a marathon different. rather than a sprint. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, the other thing is like the philosophy that we're pushing is also something that is becoming, is like on an upward trajectory of how appealing that is to people in the world. I think more and more people are realizing like, holy crap, you know, with the increase in technology and the increase in social media, I have to do things that um, are in the real world. I, you know, have to find the things that make me uncomfortable and tackle them head on or else I'm never going to accomplish what I want to. So I feel like that's already, that's just like, we're just starting on like that becoming like a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Being comfortable, being uncomfortable is starting to become more and more cool. Mm -hmm. This is a hypothetical question, but if Yes Theory is a startup, I'm Shane Smith. I think your community is very valuable to me, mm-hmm. and I, I think uh, I think not only not only your your huge social footprint, but what seek discomfort and your whole package could be in ten years. Mm-hmm. And I I, w- I would want to acquire you. What would you say? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I would tell, say, how much me. is your company worth? I'll acquire you. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, we'll, but so we'll I, and, and I'm curious. So, so is this? So is this something that is? This is not something you're clearly dying to sell and cash out and move on. Uh, It'd be hilarious to look back at this video in ten years and be like, "Hell no!" When, yeah, and yes, they're they're on a yes, beach yes, house yes, in yeah, for exactly. one billion dollars. Um, <laughs> I think they're dying to not like the opposite. Yeah, but yeah, which is valuable, I think. Yeah. So, do you know how many people build startups for that acquisition? I think several businesses that will start around Yes Theory will will likely be acquired, um, but I don't think because Yes Theory is it's like our heart and soul. Um, Mm-hmm. That can't be acquired, you know. It's like yeah. that's for just pretty much for life, um, and I think if you remove that, then you remove a huge part of ourselves, and we'll feel so empty and so sad that it would not make zero sense. And uh, what I think Matt is is alluding to, which is actually a really interesting business thing, is that like yes, there is an umbrella, and different things are going to start living under them. Mm-hmm. And I think the time it makes se- makes sense for something there to be acquired is if we can't push something to the scale that another company or entity can so for example with seek discomfort if it ever gets to a place where we're like well independently we can't turn this into a nike but if we give it to those guys they're not going to scrap it and turn it off but they're going to actually send it to the masses and this thing is going to become something worldwide it's again not about us owning it or them owning it it's about you know it reaching to the masses and not making a difference to the world so i think the moment that they'll even consider uh selling different pieces under this umbrella entity are when they feel like they've taken it as far as they can go and there's a strategic partner there can that can take it farther mm-hmm. um that's a more professional answer than fuck off <laughs> <laughs> well I you know i think I Shane, hope, I hope if further. you ever see this <laughs> <laughs> the reason i think this is so interesting is because you're you know say the same goal is shared between you but you guys look at it from very different perspectives mm-hmm. which is really cool um okay i want to talk a little bit about uh seek discomfort um and 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 that message um because recently i don't know kind of recently you guys put out a documentary uh called frozen alive um Mm -hmm. detailing uh i mean i don't want to get too much into it but essentially like detailing you guys in the middle of poland with this crazy guy named wim hof freezing yourself um, (laughs) to to seek discomfort and i'm sure there's much more to that Mm -hmm. um but uh how uh, like I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is how much is seeking discomfort and, and what's the limit? That's basically what I'm trying to say, right? What is the limit mm-hmm. to seeking discomfort before it starts to become a life threatening motto? For sure. So the way, uh, cause yeah, when you make a tagline, like seek discomfort, it can be interpreted in all sorts of ways. Kind of sure. like just do it. Yeah. Just do it can be just do drugs. Yeah. You know, it could be all sorts of things, but. Um, what we try and reinforce in everything we do is it has to be personal. It has to be relevant to what you want um, and how you want to approach life, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so we kind of give that trust to whoever is watching in our audience and whoever sees the tagline and be like, interpret it, interpret this in the way that makes sense for you. Um, in terms of how far you should take it, uh, there have definitely been a few moments, including that one, where we felt very close to that edge very close to that line um and as as much as we learned from it and as you know as much as we got out of it uh it could have gone really wrong um and we realized that after the fact yeah and uh, especially zach was with being the 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 more uh uh i guess parental out of the group um was 
the most of, like aware of that line because for, for us we're like yeah let's do it we're excited go 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 and then all of a sudden you're like on top of a mountain in negative 20 degree weather in, shorts. in your shorts yeah and the guy who took you up there is sprinting down the mountain faster than you. Oh, shit. So you better catch up to him. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to freeze to death. Literally. Like, I mean, parts of the video we couldn't even show because it, it got so bad. Like, we had to stay huddled together for like 20 minutes to like put skin to skin and be like warm up a little bit before heading back down the mountain. It's scary when you, it's like, it's like when you see the pilot start freaking out and push yeah. a bunch of different buttons. Like, dude, what? No, I was supposed to be, you're supposed to be in charge. <laughs> but one of the things I'll say is that like, if you don't push yourself to that limit and find out where that line is, then you're probably not pushing yourself far mm-hmm. enough yes. because if you're just kind of like seeking discomfort in these small ways and never being like, Oh shit, that's a limit. Um, then you're probably not even close to that limit. So I think experiences right. like that are, are what show us like, oh, wait, okay, now we know next time we ever venture into anything that's similar to that, mm-hmm. we need to make sure we have these precautions in place. Yeah. Um, and so now we know the limit. <laughs> and, yeah. and, I, and I think a common misinterpretation with seek discomfort is say yes to everything. Oh, dude, we get that all the time. Right? Like, yeah. yes theory, I, I saw, I don't know, I'm not calling anyone out. I saw an intro to one of your videos where it was like, yes theory, they say yes to everything. Yeah. And it's like, Thomas, like, uh, nope. <laughs> You've been on Logan's podcast, <laughs> the guys who say yes to everything. I was yeah. like, Logan, <laughs> no. <laughs> and, but that's, that's a very important distinction because right. like if it's, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we jump into lava, seek discomfort, say yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and Matt said yes to everything and ended up in a red dress with spray tan and <laughs> care yes. in mexico yeah, in mexico um but i think it's say yes to the things that scare you and will lead to personal development and growth okay would you describe that differently 100 percent. yeah it, i think it's almost uh it's almost a cop-out to say yes to to everything you know or to say yes to like again i use the example of like drugs or partying because i mean that's just the easy available one that <laughs> seems kind of risky and exciting but in reality it's like you're not doing anything like you're not really pushing yourself yeah. let me add this too because i'm the no man in yes theory like everyone mm-hmm. whenever brands are coming to me and they're like let's collaborate or like a, a alcohol brand will be like let's collaborate and i'll be like no and they'll be like well aren't you guys supposed to say yes to everything and i'm like interesting who you have to say no to well first of all i say no to 90 percent of the things but the other thing that i've realized is when you say no to something you're saying yes to something else mm-hmm. to matt's point when you say no to drugs you're saying yes to or like when you say no to going to that party on friday night you could be saying yes to staying in and working on your craft and working on your videos or working on your instrument, like playing your instrument. So every time you say no to something, it's actually indirectly a yes to whatever you're replacing that thing with. Um, and so I think, and and then the same way inverse, right? Like when you say no to something, it's usually because you're saying yes to something else. When a friend asks you if you want to like put your phone off all weekend and go on a trip and you say no, it's probably because you're saying yes to that fear that comes from that or the discomfort from, that comes from that. And so no and yes are usually like a yin and yang. Yeah. Um, so when you say They're one, the, you're saying the other. Yeah, that, that's really mm-hmm. interesting. And so if I think of, if I, we kind of talked a little bit about yes theory and their, their long, your long term t- trajectory basically, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, and we, it's obvious now you're their manager, the business guy behind the scenes, and you're part of the creative team pushing mm-hmm. the brand forward. Um, but I've always been curious about um, how the work is split up. And there, and people know this, but there are much more people than just Matt, Thomas, and Mark mm-hmm. and you, right? There are many people behind the scenes working. Mm-hmm. But how do you, Amar, um, and Thomas uh, actually split up the work between you um, if you think of a company, if you think of C-level employees, how would that work? Mm-hmm. I'd say the simplest way of splitting it up for people for, for it to make sense to people, because it does kind of mix and vary, yeah. would be um, uh, I'm mostly on pre-production. Uh, and then we've just hired recent, like working with the producer right now to help me out a little more. Um, Tom or Mar is mostly on the production, like the director on the scene. Um, making sure the angles are right, the story is right, etc. And Thomas will be, since the beginning, has been mostly post-production. Um, so overseeing that the story is being told in the right way. Uh, and that's just YouTube. So um, what we've kind of tried to do now is, because we because we get so excited about new ideas and new projects, mm-hmm. um, those tasks kind of get, like we've had the problem of getting distracted quite often. Um so it's always pulling back to, okay, what are we good at? And what we're good at has always been, okay, our ideas and our friendship and the storytelling and um, making things that seem impossible possible. Uh, 
and for example seek discomfort like running a whole clothing brand when i was running my clothing brand to be honest i wasn't doing a great job and so finding somebody like zach who was in streetwear or shopify and yeah. our new creative director brian who has worked with several huge brands to run that ship saves us an enormous amount of time to stay and do what we're good at which is continue making content and so i think another thing that we're really really particularly good at and that i'm really proud of us for is hiring the right people and convincing them to hop on board like you should see dude zach's been here for a year and zach has had like 30 job offers like the man is very requested in the city Mm -hmm. Uh, and you should and i think you talk about hiring people and mm -hmm. that's an interesting thing i think if i was the viewer that i would be interested in just because you don't see that in front of the camera yeah um yeah and that's a and that's kind of a thing where we Sometimes there's a, a, a sense of guilt too, because we because we're on camera, we get a lot of the credit. But for example, my little brother Titty, yeah. who's our editor, mm-hmm. and he's been editing for three years, works probably more than any of us. You know, he's at that desk for ten hours a day, and you're just like, God, if only people saw the work that this kid puts into these videos. Yeah. So we try it and shows that like a lot of the behind the scenes and give him credit. Um, but I don't think it'll ever do it full justice to what he actually puts in well, to the team. And to add to that, I don't think, and this is not like roasting or anything, but mm-hmm. I don't think people actually realize how much work goes into a YouTube video, yeah. let, let alone YouTube videos that are incredibly labor intensive. Mm-hmm. It's like, they're not like daily vlogs, oh, which, yeah. which are a ton of work on their own. Right. Like these are like flying out pizza. Deli- let me just read some of your titles. I, I wrote some of that. <laughs> yeah. okay. Abandoned Island of Death. I took my pizza delivery guy around the world, stranded at sea for 24 hours. I lived in a luxury airport for four days, nobody noticed, spinning the globe and flying wherever it lands, 24 hours in Korea with zero dollars, and the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. That is a lot. Those are heavy (laughs) titles. Reading them is exhausting. Yeah. So how does how do you guys like manage the amount of work that is you you guys have to be consistent um, as uh, in in regards in, in your YouTube efforts efforts? Well, what is the 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 process of creating a video? Um, mm. Because it's much more than just a thumbnail. Um, to start it off, the the answer is it's a work in progress. Yeah, uh, we we haven't fully figured it out, and we're trying to figure it out. Um, the the thought process that goes into it, at least from my perspective, is what is everyone's core competencies and skills? And then also what are the skills that they don't have developed that they want to develop? So there's we're treating it like a company where, you know, when you join on a, a good company, they'll say like, well, what do you want to end up doing? What's, a, what's your five year personal growth path? And what are the skills that you want to develop? And can we help you develop those? So in the same way where uh, Titty might be full, like core competency is storytelling or editor, um, he might turn around and say, well, you know what? I'm kind of interested in producing as well and maybe doing a little bit of ideation. Mm -hmm. And we have to be able to facilitate an environment where he feels empowered to develop those skills here. Because like any other company, if we don't provide that, then talent will leave like they do any other company. Um, And I think it's naive from our parts to think that this thing is always going to be uh, luxurious and sexy to someone. Yeah. Yeah. So I think from, from my perspective, it's always, and I try to have these conversations with the guys as well as all the other people that are uh, behind the scenes of like, well, what do you want in five years? And can I help you as a manager get to that place in five years? And can I help you get there here? And if, if the case is no and the opportunity isn't there, then I think amicably we can split ways um, and we wish you the best and we'll find someone that fits that role. But um, I think more cases than not, especially for brilliant people like like Titty, his brother, yeah. um, it's like, well, we have to try to find a way to do that within here because you're way too intelligent and bright uh, to let that talent escape this this entity. Um, but in terms of how the videos are done, that's more of what Mac can talk exactly. about. Forever, we were uh, we would go to a place and and just hope the video would work out, that we would meet somebody and a, a title would come out of it and an idea would come. Uh, it wasn't until about, what, like eight months ago? Six months ago? No, longer than that. Longer Let's say a year. A Let's year? say a year. Yeah, maybe, a year. maybe even yeah, a little yeah. bit more, yeah. Um, that we realized how important a title is, how mm-hmm. important a thumbnail is, uh, how important structure is before you even jump into filming. So now what the process looks like is... Um, uh, we'll, especially Thomas Amar and I, will sit down individually, come up with as many ideas as we can over X amount of days, send out a prompt for the team to also come up with ideas and send them to us, uh, take all of those ideas, put them in an Excel sheet, 
and have uh, the rest of the team uh, vote on the ideas out of five. So one to five. Five is an amazing idea. One's terrible. Um, we average out. If you make it above four, those ideas go into a separate Excel sheet where uh, all the best ideas live. And from that, we schedule them into our calendar. So uh, as spontaneous, like it, it is still quite spontaneous. Like we'll still like hop on a plane tomorrow without even knowing that we were doing it the day before. Um, but it's definitely more structured than it used to be where we realize like we need to, for our own sanity, like you said, because this stuff is so in- insane, like we need to know more where we're going to be and what we're going to do. Um, Cause otherwise, yeah, you just kind of go crazy. Yeah. And I, I think, tr- I think lastly, I want to, I definitely want to talk about this. Um, uh, there's a lot more to the yes theory brand than, uh, on YouTube um, mm-hmm. and then on, on social media, uh, you're interested in investing. I've heard in, mm-hmm. in that, um, and, and there and you know Matt and Amar have their or Thomas and Amar have their own uh, things going on outside of or mm-hmm. intertwined, but kind of outside of Yes Theory. Um, and this is uh, this is a question for Zach. This is a question from Matt and, and essentially Th- Thomas and Amar too. Um, t- t- we've I-, I talked about this briefly, but many people start companies to sell them mm-hmm. to kind of cash out. Um, build this like Silicon Valley, right? Build this startup. It gets acquired by Facebook. Move on. Mm -hmm. I have a big bag of money. Then I could become a serial entrepreneur. And we've seen that happen with many people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. That's totally fine. But how how important uh, is money in the equation of what you guys are doing? Hmm. This is, that's for both of you. Good question. You want to go first? Uh, You can go first. first. How important? Well, I mean, I'm biased. I'm the manager. So, uh, (laughs) Um, I think it's essential because the thing is like money is the gasoline of the car, right? And if you don't have the gasoline in the car, it stops running. Um, and you know, if you're putting like for us, um, if, if they don't have an abundance of money, then the scale of the things that we do are going to reach less people. Mm -hmm. For, so for me, the, the money is what is making us able to get the message out to as big of an audience as possible. And I think what they've done a phenomenal job at is using that money in also ways that benefit the community, whether it's paying for the student, like paying off the student loans for one of their subscribers, whether it's flying the pizza guy across the world to Italy, whether it's, you know, finding people who don't have money, but are great humans and making their dreams come true. Um, And then hopefully as they grow in scale and the money becomes more, we can start to do more work with nonprofits and giving back and uh, partnering with organizations that also have a really strong give back portion um, where we can use the money to change the world. But I think for us, the money is the, the thing that without it's, it's like a, you can't live without it and too much of it is dangerous. Yeah. Um, so it's finding the right bits and then being very, very strategic, um, with how we use it and making sure we're using it for things that are essential and needed to grow this message and not for luxuries like, uh, driving a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think the analogy I'd use is uh, is kind of what Blake Mikowski did to Tom's with Tom's. Yeah. Um, the one to one model or yeah, yeah. social entrepreneurship in general is a pretty recent thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think social uh, content is also probably going to be uh, similar, where you can give back, and we do, and that brings value to us and to, uh, and uh, I mean it fulfills us, but at the same time. Like Zach said, you need the gasoline. You need to to make money. And I think, especially when you do give back, there's this thing where you're like not supposed to make that much money, you know, where you're supposed to be like Mother Teresa and just forego all yeah, capital. Like the giving pledge, right? Have yeah, exactly. Like giving a, exactly. Like Bill Gates, 99.96% right. of your wealth or something like that. Right. Um, but if you've ever been broke, you know, like just how hard it is to have no money. It's tough. You know, mm-hmm. and to not forget that like, you know, like we started with nothing and to go back to that place is like, is something we never want to like go through again. And mm-hmm. so we want to make sure we're very careful with, um, how we spend our money, how we value our brand, uh, and how we n- make sure we know what we're worth. Mm-hmm. You know? And, and I think, uh, lastly, at this point, I think, uh, people might think that a YouTuber, a YouTube group with 4 million subscribers is like driving Ferraris and living large. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that's going back to building the brand, Mm -hmm. right? Like growing it. Almost too much sometimes. (laughs) 
Uh, yeah. yeah, but like keeping keeping the machine going. All right. Lastly, I want to I want to end this off by talking just briefly about future plans mm-hmm. um, for you guys. Uh, uh, we've touched on this quite a bit in this podcast, which I'm glad we did because it's always been what I'm cur- most curious about. Um, but you guys see Yes Siri in, in ten years, Yes Theory, or even ten years, and then let's say thirty five years. Yes Theory is, and then maybe tease a couple future projects coming up. I would almost say it's impossible to know what Yes Theory is going to be in 35 years. I think that in such a fast-moving industry, as well as in such a fast-moving company, um, it's almost hard to know what a year is going to look like. So we try to set goals on a shorter term basis and have an idea. Like I think there's an, it's important for the team to have alignment on what direction we're moving into, but almost being t- having too much of a concrete idea leaves uh, not enough room for pivoting. And I think we don't even know what the world is going to look like in 35 years for us to be like, that's the thing we want to go do it. But um, saying like, again, coming back to the core values and beliefs that the team holds, like that will carry us forward um and then yeah i guess maybe do you, you have anything to add no to i mean i 100 percent agree uh, richard branson so, says this all the time it's like why do you would you need a five-year plan one-year plan max but five-year plan you're out of your mind how the hell do you know it's gonna happen in five years you know um i, I think like the way we are like you said if you have the why like whatever obstacles come your way or whatever opportunities come your way you'll have that filter so you know exactly what you need to do. Yeah. Um, I think the the short term plan is on one of the back of these pieces of paper to sign a contract with Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that's one day entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then in terms of projects, I think um, that we can tease is just like content on different platforms, and there's nothing that is going to be necessarily released in the short term future that we can like directly say but uh, like Matt was alluding to like one day we'll hopefully have a yes festival one day we'll hopefully have a book one day um, a a podcast uh, that we deem is is valuable to the audience and educational and, and filled with knowledge that we find is is essential for the audience to, to have and to grasp onto um, will come out but I think all those decisions will be made at a time where we feel like one we have the capacity to do them in the right way mm-hmm. and we're approaching them because we feel like the audience is getting value from them We've been very careful about like while a trend is going on, like while all YouTubers are jumping on podcasts yes. to make sure that we're not just doing it because it makes a buck, but we have to do it because we actually have a reason to do it. It's the same thing with courses, like courses got really hot and everyone's doing a course, but we'll look within ourselves and say, okay, is there honest curriculum and structure that we have one, the time and the capacity to draw out? that can be valuable to our audience to the point where we feel like if we sign them up for 50 bucks, that's actually worth it for them. Um, Or if we were 18 years old, would we feel that if we signed up for that class that we would deem it worth it? And if not, it's not worth it to do, even if it adds more money into the system. Um, So checking ourselves and the good thing about having a a team and not just an individual is that everyone checks one another and makes sure that if an idea is brought up, it passes through all the filters. All right, that ladies and gentlemen, that is Matt Dowher, the co-founder of Yes Theory, and uh, Zach Hanover, uh, Yes Theory's manager. Thank you both for coming Thank on the program. Girl.